too? Um, yeah. Yeah. You have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> I am an out of town. <laughs> they could be having a laugh at our expense right now, yeah. as far as we know. Um, what? There is no out. There is no out. <laughs> That's in an alternate dimension. Uh, well, uh, I guess I can welcome you to the show since it's really just kind of starting about now, right? So welcome to the show. I'm not Thanks. officially a part of it, other than I'm up here. Um, you're at the Comics Experience panel on uh, breaking into comics, so if that's where you want to be, great. If not, stick around. Yeah. Awesome. The chairs are comfortable. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about, and we're going to be happy to take questions from the audience. Um, you can either save them, and we'll we'll have sort of a Q and A at the end, or we're, we can be kind of casual because of the crowd size here, which is good. Um, so just a little bit about kind of what I do. I run Comics Experience, which is the world's largest online comic book school, which is at comicsexperience.com, or if you're feeling filthy, comicsexperience.com, which both my brothers pointed out to me immediately right when the site went online. Um, we teach courses on writing, penciling, inking, coloring, lettering. We have classes on law, um, and we have a creator's workshop, which is an online forum 24-7. Um, and, and if you upload to the site, it says comic sex dot 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 com. It's right. awesome. It's pretty great. <laughs> um, we also have a publishing program. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We have a publishing program, so if you're within our community going through courses or our workshop and you're, and you're workshopping your work, it's eligible to submit to the publishing program, which is, um, we have a deal right now with SourcePoint Press, and it's distributed through Diamond and all that kind of stuff. So if any of that interests you, um, Joe is going to pass around these little clipboards, and you can just sign your name uh, and an email address on there, and we'll just add you a newsletter. It goes out about once a month, and then you can learn all you could want to know about comics. Justify my existence. That way. Um, and now I'll get to the point where we talk about panelists. So we'll start down here with Vito. Vito, do you want to introduce yourself? I Tell us a little bit about what you've done. Oh, what have I done? Oh, <laughs> what have you done? Um, let's see. Uh, I'm probably best known at this point for my creator on the series Stray and Action Lab Comics, but I've worked on um, Marvel books, DC books, uh, a couple of image things here and there. But, you know, uh, small things, big things, mostly self published stuff. Cool. Greg? Um, I have been, uh, my name is Greg Pock. I, uh, I've been writing comics for about 15 years now. Um, I'm probably best known for Planet Hulk. Uh, right now I'm writing Firefly and Star Wars, uh, an Agents of Atlas book, and um, Ronan Island, a creator-owned book at, at Boom Studios. Um, I, uh, I came into comics from film. I went to film school. Well, actually, I mean, if you go way back, I was drawing comics when I was a little kid. Um, uh, and I, I, did con I, I drew cartoons for my high school paper and all that kind of stuff, but I went to um, NYU for film, uh, film school, and I made a bunch of short films, and I made a feature film called Robot Stories, and then moved sideways into comics, and I've been uh, basically doing that ever since. Awesome. Joe Sergi? I'm, I'm the guy here to give you guys hope. So, I'm Joe. I'm here to hand out the clipboard. Um, I am a mostly a novelist. I have a young adult novel series, and I work with Comics Experience as their, the, I teach all the law courses. So I wrote a book called Comic Book Law for the Comic Book Creator that is the, I think at one time was the only book on the subject. So I'm really here for q and I'm sure, at the end, because I get nervous when I sit out there and they answer questions. I go, no, no, that's all right. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so, but I've taken every comics experience class. I would highly recommend them all. I also have created some independent comics, Great Zombies in History, um, and then a couple others. I don't remember them. Yeah, that's what happens when you're a lawyer. Your right. brain turns so much. Um, and my name's Andy Schmidt. I started in comics uh, um, in 2002. I got hired as an assistant editor at Marvel and was in the Marvel Heroes office. And that was a really, uh, really cool time to work at Marvel. Um, I got to work on Civil War, The Winter Soldier. Um, and I, I'm best known probably for, kind of like Greg, um, but best known for Annihilation, which is what led to the Guardians of the Galaxy as we know them today. Revamping the cosmic world. Yeah, that was, that was, my, that was my baby, um, uh, which was a lot of fun. And then I left there, started Comics Experience. I had been a college uh, instructor, 
I wouldn't say I was a professor, but instructor before that. Nope. And I had created some classes for, for comics there. So I started Comics Experience. Then I went to IDW, where I was a senior editor. I got to relaunch G.I. Joe from scratch, work on Transformers, Star Trek, and started working in L.A. a lot more. Uh, left there to go to Hasbro, where I was in charge of their, I was an intellectual property and brand director. Sounds very exciting. About as exciting as that sounds. Um, didn't love that work, but met a lot of really interesting people. Um, and then I've been freelance since 2013, running Comics Experience and, and freelance writing. And I have written for just about every publisher at this point, um, as well as children's short stories. And I do some consulting in, in LA. Um, but my real passion is trying to help folks figure out, like knock down some hurdles, um, how, to, how to circumvent obstacles, you know, all that kind of stuff is really what I, what my real passion is, so that's why I do this. Um, so I've got this PowerPoint and we'll kind of run through it and you guys can chime in whenever you want and then we'll end on a Q&A just to, we'll just have a chat. But I like to start with the three fundamentals of breaking into comics uh, and the first one is talent. So we're all doomed. Um, but the way I look at talent is, is that weird? I don't know, is everyone else hearing like the uh, so but I was being subtle. You weren't supposed to know that yeah. I was subtly. Did everyone say yeah, I subtly moved the microphone? That was yeah. like a knife. Like I was like a ninja. So the way I look at talent is is sort of that vision, right, in your head. How many of you are interested in writing comics? Yeah, how many of you are interested in the art side of things? Bit of both. Anybody on the bit of both side? Okay. So. So for an artist, like a, a lot of times, you know, we can see the image that we want to produce. We can see it in our mind's eye. And the same thing for writers, really, like we've got the idea for the story, like we know the story, but something happens between our brains and either typing on the screen or drawing on the page and, and things get lost in translation or it's, it's difficult to get it to work right. But that talent really, I think, is really that vision. Like if you've got that vision for that story or for, the, for those images, then you've got the talent already like it's there right um so i am a hundred percent serious when i say i believe that everybody has talent like it's it's there you, there might be some work involved to to bring it to the surface but everybody has talent so you're already a third of the way there um, <laughs> which if you're in school is still enough but let's keep going so persistence is is what i have up here as the second one and persistence kind of picks up where talent may leave off, where persistence is whether it's, <laughs> thank you, whether it's taking classes, whether it's One just on the job time. training, whether it's the books you read. Um, Greg's got a really wonderful wonderful book that he co-wrote with Fred Van Lente. Is it Becky? Becky was the artist on that, right? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, no. Uh, no, 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 uh, Colleen Cooper. Colleen Cooper, I'm sorry, yes. Um, uh, called Making Comics Like the Pros. I've got a book called The Insider's Guide to Creating Comics and Graphic Novels, which, which is, it kind of runs through the whole process and gives really good storytelling tips for, for artists. I've also got a book called The Comics Experience Guide to Writing Comics. So there are lots of different ways that you, can, that you can learn and work, but persistence is doing the work, right? And what that starts to do is break down that barrier between your vision and where you kind of get to. So you're, you're, what you produce is much closer to that initial vision in a lot of ways. A little oversimplified, but so if you've got both of those things, how many of you have the have the gumption to be persistent enough to, to get this done? Okay. All right. You're like sixty six percent of the way there. The people that are getting raise their hands is it just if you don't know, like like just trying to be honest, like saying, oh I don't know. Right, yeah. But I mean don't look at it that way. Like just you know, just do the work. Yeah, make make the time to work on it. That's, that's one of the keys. So the third thing, the third category is luck, which is really kind of being in the right place at the right time, or being in the right email box, perhaps, at the right time. Um, it doesn't mean you physically have to be located in the right place at the right time. But if you've got that talent and you've got that persistence, that should kind of take care of the luck, because you're, you're persistent, you're communicating, you might be networking, if that should work out for you. Um, the same way that if you've got that vision, 
um, and you maybe aren't as persistent as other people are, if you're lucky and you wind up in the right place at the right time, that can work out too for an opportunity or two. Um, or, and nobody think of any comic creator ever, if you're a talentless hack, uh, but you're persistent and lucky, uh, that can work out too. Um, but obviously, if you are all three, <laughs> hmm, uh, try that. Uh, but obviously, if you're all three, then then things are going to happen a little bit, a little bit sooner um, for you. This is all kind of track. Yeah, this is all macro level, and then we can there's, get into some nitty gritty. Yeah, there's uh, you know, in, in terms of like the um, talent and persistence thing. I when I was a kid, I uh, I was a huge Ray Bradbury fan, um, and uh, I think my grandma gave me a, a one 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 Christmas. She gave me this. Uh, giant collected volume of Ray Bradbury stories, and in the front was an introduction. Um, and the title of the introduction was Drunk and in Charge of a Bicycle. And it was basically Ray Bradbury talking about his early days as a writer. And so I, I was reading this at the age of about like nine or 10, and I, at that point I already knew that I wanted to be a writer. Um, uh, but this essay was really, um, it's, it was really formative for me uh, because it was sort of scary and also really welcoming at the same time. Because he basically described um, as a young writer uh, sort of giving himself the challenge of writing a story every week. And so for weeks and weeks and weeks he wrote a story, uh, you know, he's basically best known for his short stories. Even his best known novels are really collections of short stories in a way, like Martian Chronicles, they're really episodic. But anyway, so he, he gave himself this challenge of writing a short story every single week and he did it for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then he described this moment when he wrote something, and he finished a story, and then he thought for the first time, oh, that, that one was good. You know? Um, and this is after he'd been doing this for many, many weeks. You know? Like, I, I don't remember exactly how many, but I, in my memory, it's like he, he'd been doing it for like a year or something. You know? He'd, he'd done countless stories. And then finally he realized, oh, he he'd finally written a good story. He finally recognized that he'd written something good. Um, and that was sort of daunting because it's like, oh, so you've got to sit down and just do it for weeks and weeks and weeks. But it was, it's also really welcoming and exciting because it's like, oh, okay. So if you do do that, you'll get better, you know? And, um, and it, it, sort of, it, was, it was great because it sort of gave me permission to not expect everything I write to be fantastic particularly in those early early days, you know, that, 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 I mean, I've heard other people say we all have like a hundred bad stories in us, you know what I mean, or, you know, like stories that don't quite work, you know, and we just have to get them out, you know, that's just part of the process. It's fine to be terrible. In fact, it's essential to be terrible, you know, like, like, get just because you just have to work it through. You have to figure out what works and what doesn't. And the only way to do that is just to do it. But that, so that, that you know, like having that drive, but then just, just you know, slogging through it. And, and uh, I mean, we have, we're under so much pressure in this world today um, to sort of be geniuses. And I think genius is a myth. I don't believe in genius. You know, like, I, I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, yeah, what is, you know, what, I mean, I mean, I'm a genius, but, right. no, but uh, no, but, uh, you know, like, I, you know, I watched Amadeus, and it's like, I actually identify more with Salieri than Amadeus, you know what I mean? Most like, yeah, you know, I mean, the stuff that, that you think comes out, you know, you see, like, you go, go down to Artist Alley, and you can watch any artist sit there and draw in front of you, and it looks like they're just geniuses, because they're doing this thing that no one else can do. You know, like this incredible thing is flowing out of their finger. How, how on earth can they do that? They must be geniuses. No, they've just been drawing since they were three, you know, five hours a day. You know what I mean? Just because they love it. And, 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 that's, and, and that's something that's open to everybody. You know, like, you have to have that, in, I mean, like, I mean, the way Andy put it is talent. Um, I mean, I would, I would say, instead of talent, I'd say spark. I mean, I mean, I, yeah. it, you know, the phrase is all the same, but it's like, you have to have something, you have to have a story, you have to have something to say, right? Um, but, uh, uh, but you can learn the craft of it, you know? Uh, like, the craft is accessible, you know? Um, anyway, that's, that, that's, that, that's, that's well, what I Well, I think what you're saying, too, applies beyond just, like, the craft of, of writing or of art. Like, it applies in just learning how things are done within 
the industry. Like, you kind of crashed into the industry. Like, when you came in, because you came in through the, the program at Marvel where they were actively looking for new writers, and and you, I, I don't even know if you'd seen a comic book script at that point. No, I hadn't. I hadn't and yeah. your scripts came in, and, and it was like, wow, that guy writes a lot, a lot of words. It was like Amadeus. It's like too many notes. Yes. Too many words, Greg. Yes. Too many words. It's true. It's true. But, I, I've apologized to Charlie you, Edward, my, my, my first artist that I worked with for those scripts. Oh, uh, yeah. If only he'd gone on to do a hit comic. Yeah, exactly. I ruined his career, obviously. He's, he's the guy who ended up drawing Walking Dead. So, uh, so we don't need to cry too much for Charlie. Yeah, he, he got over it. But uh, but, but that, I mean, and that was. And I don't mean to, you know, sort of disparage the way that you were writing because the stories were there. But you know, he, you just didn't know kind of how things were done. And and by doing it, you eventually got to the point where your scripts are are you know look, you know, they're they're more easily to digest. Yep. Um, and you know that was true for me. You know, I came in through editorial, and I didn't know anything. Like my first six months at Marvel were atrocious. Uh, first of all, I came in at a time when they were bankrupt um, and they were firing everybody. So every Friday night was a goodbye party. Oh my God. For, for at least one person, if not multiple people. And I went there knowing this was all happening, thinking I might only have a job for two or three months, so I'll just learn as much as I can in that time period. And I was pretty sure at any given moment I was just fired. Um, Got it that right, they might have almost gone bankrupt. <laughs> um, fortunately, I didn't get fired, but I mean, I mean, there was so much to learn about production of comics, about the manufacturing, about the literal printing of comics. There was all this stuff that I like. I really hadn't thought about that at all, and I just learned it, like on the job, because you didn't have a, uh, have a choice. But it was all it was all sort of that grind. Um, yeah. So um, I can speak actually okay. to the luck part. Yeah. Um, I think um, if you ask Greg and Andy how they know me or where they met me, I worked in retail. Um, and anybody else work in retail in this room? Oh, yeah. How much do you hate? <laughs> you hate it, right? You think, oh, well, I'm going to be Especially around the lot. Sure. And so I worked in a comic book store right across from the Empire State Building. And Andy would come in every week. And Greg, he actually sold his uh, Robot Story script book. Oh, yeah. I think before he good. actually did a book at Marvel. So we. You know, we kind of have known each other, you know, for a long, long time. And I, um, I got into uh, comics from an actor. And uh, as you can see, I am a hard-looking human being. So no one would hire me. So what I started doing is, all right, since no one's hiring me to act, I'm going to write my own movies. So I started writing my own movies, and very early on in AOL days, uh, probably dating myself here, uh, I put up on a message board, does anybody need a script doctor? And two guys contacted me and they were both comic book writers. So I looked at their scripts, uh, basically becoming an editor, I don't, I don't know why, but um, I, every time I would look at uh, comic book scripts, I'd realize I'm doing too much editing on this, I'm making this much better than it ever was, so I'm now learning how to write comics. Um, Never wanted to do Marvel or DC at first. I just wanted to self-publish and do my own creator own stuff. Um, somehow or other, though, like I made friends with Dean Haspiel, who was downstairs. Uh, he was one of my customers, one of our regulars, you know, every week, and he and I would just wax philosophical about comics. What's wrong with comics? What? What's your, what are you reading? What do you like? You know, what? You know, what is your end game? And you know, it came out that I, I like to write a comic. Some point. Dean got an opportunity to do Batman Adventures, uh, which was Dan Slott and Ty Templeton's book, uh, exclusively. Uh, but they had to take a month off, so Joan Hilty, the editor, looked for somebody to do like a fill in issue. Dean and his buddy Gabe did like the lead story, and Dean asked me if I wanted to do the backup. That was five pages that changed my life. Uh, I have been writing pretty regularly since 2006. Uh, whether it be published or not, you know, but my first published book was a five-page story in a DC comic, which doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Like, it, like I'm sure it'll come up, and Andy, I'm sure, has said this many times in, in the past and on Khan's experience, but no one breaks in the same way. Yeah. Absolutely no one, like, do not follow my path, don't follow anybody's path that you listen to. We're all going to break in differently. But the, uh, I mean, to the luck thing, too, it's like the, um, 
I mean, the reality is that there are uh, some folks who have more resources than other people. You know, I mean, so it's, it's unfair to begin with, and it's going to be harder for some people to keep going. You know, I, I, I think a lot, a, a large part of it is like, how long can you keep going? You know, um, and if you can keep going long enough, you know, and give yourself the time to get good enough uh, and keep showing up, then eventually you'll, and, and keep producing stuff, then eventually you'll, you know, th then that luck has a chance to hit, right? Um, but uh, it's, you know, but I, I, mean, I think it's important to recognize that that's not financially possible for everybody, you know? I mean, the good thing is that comics is an art form that can be practiced with very little uh, money, you know, like if, if, I mean, really time is what you need. Um, I mean, you have to have time, I mean, time costs, right? So, uh, so money is, of course, a factor, um, always, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's at least less punishing than, say, film or, or a lot of other art forms. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why comics has always, I think, been uh, a place where exciting things happen first, you know, because people, don't have to get as much money together from other people in order to make something that's in their head. Um, so anyway, this is just a way to recognize the difficulty of it, you know, and that, that it's, it's a lot harder for some than others. Yeah, and wait, but before go ahead. on the persistence side, there's persistence of craft, but I have a unique perspective because I think I was your first student, right, online. Yeah, you were in the first and I was in the first person. forum. And so I've been in the forum since, which is this online community of all of us, and the people who have succeeded are people drop off like flies. Yeah. The people who have succeeded are the people that go to every show. Comics is actually a really small community. And so like, it, they, you can't do it anymore because now he's too popular, but you could come to Baltimore Comic Con and then meet Frank Miller in the bar and ask him about Dark Knight Returns and how he decided to write it. Like, I, we've actually done that. When a, a group of us did that, when we were first in Andy's class, we were like, oh my God, they're all at the bar. We used to go to a bar in New York called Mulligan's and hang out and hope that we would see people that we knew who did the books to ask them. That was the Marvel bar. Yeah, the Marvel bar, yeah. we'd hang out. But, but so the people, and in my writing group, I was going to take off names, but I won't do that for fear of offending mm -hmm. people. But like, of my original writing group, the people, like five of them, are still in comics. And the five of them are doing, you know, anything from DC and Marvel books to they have their own independent lines to they're doing Kickstarters and doing what they love. They're all doing what they love. The rest of them dropped off. They just gave up. One of them works in marketing, another one works for in a supermarket. They just didn't stick with it. So you have to kind of stick right. with it as well. And, so. and that's not a judgment on right. on them. I mean everybody has to do their own sort of analysis of the what I call the value proposition, right? Like for me, uh, I decided I wanted to get into comics when I was in college. I had been a comic reader growing up. I had two older brothers introduced me into it. And then I kind of left comics when I was in college. I went to college in, in Tennessee on top of a mountain. Like just getting comics was difficult. Um, and so I just kind of had dropped off. And then I rediscovered them uh, when my older brother said, hey, I think I found an internship for you. Marvel Comics does internships, like you should apply. Uh, mainly, my brother just wanted to, me to do something because I'm very lazy. <laughs> um, and he was worried that I had no work ethic. Um, and he liked to pretend that he was also my father. So uh, so this was all baked into this whole thing. And so I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, so I was like, all right, cool. That sounds, that sounds fine. Uh, as long as I don't get paid for it, uh, then it's not considered work and I can maintain my lazy image. So, <laughs> So I applied and I got the internship, and so I was an intern for one summer in 1997, and that's when I discovered editorial work and really kind of was like, oh, this is something that I would really enjoy doing, like on a day. Like I knew I'd like writing because I was writing my own short films and stuff, but but that was really seeing what editors did and working with so many creative people that was really exciting to me. So then I went back, I finished college, and then I was getting my master's degree, and I started. Working and so my first couple of comics were just stuff we did locally in St. Louis. I met some artists um, that needed that wanted to work with people with some storytelling, some writing chops. And so my first couple of comics that got that got published, um, I to this day have still not seen. 
uh, because the artists <laughs> drew them and then published them and then I and then would take them around to cons and sell them and I literally have, no, have never seen them. I've seen the art, like they'd send me JPEG, <laughs> but I've literally never seen the actual comic. Um, but I know they exist somewhere. Uh, and then finally, when I was teaching at Webster University, I had, um, by luck, I met Denny O'Neill for, for an academic paper I had written, and I invited him to come speak in St. Louis, and it turned out that his wife was a, uh, an alum of Webster University where I was teaching. So he came down and lectured, and, and I hung out with him for like this whole weekend. It was super fun, he's a great guy. Um, and he told me, and I quote, do not, under any circumstances, go into comics. <laughs> <laughs> That's Alan Moore's big uh, famous uh, yeah. ten rules of comics. The first three are don't do it. Seriously, don't do it. Yeah. Like the and, first three are literally. And, and then that was that, that. was just the opening line of this like mm -hmm. this <laughs> mom. And then and I was like, well, just so happens that the other day I got offered this this job that pays terribly at Marvel. Um, I've heard everything that you said. And I think I'm going to take it. <laughs> and my thinking on that was, well, if I don't take it, I'll never know if that would have worked out, right? So, um, so I took it and I, I sold my car and like the four things I owned and moved to New York. Um, but then writing was different. You know, writing, like Dito was saying, for me, I learned so much as an editor. Um, so this was fun. Like I was editing, uh, I was part of the editorial team on Fantastic Four when Mark Wade and Mike Baringo were on it. Uh, which was super cool, um, and then, um, but like, Wade's scripts would come in, and I didn't learn that much from his scripts, because I'd read it, and I'd be like, that's good, that's good, <laughs> <laughs> let's go with that, you know, or it might be like, oh, you misspelled this word, um, you know, but, but with folks that needed more work, that's where you really learn the stuff, is when you can, you can see ways to make things tighter, and make them fit better, and that sort of stuff. And then when I finally went, went freelance, sort of the first time when I left Marvel in 2007, I left when my wife and I had our first kid and I was a stay-at-home dad, which was really cool. But, um, but Mark Wade at that point was then the editor-in-chief at Boom Studios and he hired me. And so he was my first editor, this, this guy, Mark. And um, this is a pretty funny story, but, like, but that was really cool. It was really cool to have this dynamic where I had edited him and then he was editing me. When the first issue of that came out, it was called Challenger Deep, it's about a down submarine. When the first issue of that came out, I read it, and I was like, man, this, is, this isn't that bad. This is all right. And then I realized that's because Mark rewrote it. <laughs> <laughs> he, really, he really rewrote it? Yeah. Without telling you? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he just scripted. Like, he re, he re -scripted. He just, he doctored the dialogue, you know. And I was like, this is better than I thought it was. And I opened up the script and I'm like, it is better than I thought it was. It is legitimately better. So I wrote him an email and I was like, how dare you? Like, I never would have done this to you. Also, that sort of stuff. And I got a phone call in like 60 seconds of everything sent. And he was so apologetic. And for me, I was laughing the whole time. We all do it to me. I was like, dude, you can rewrite. In fact, I would like you to rewrite every script I write, whether it's for you or not. Um, it was all fine. But, but yeah, I mean, that. That grind, it's all about that grind. It's all about understanding, like, how long do I have, like, and giving yourself permission to suck, giving yourself permission to ask for help, yeah. giving yourself the permission to take some time. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I, the, um, yeah, I mean, patience is really, it's hard, right? You know, because, you know, we want it all yesterday. Yeah. When I, I, I started off in film school, and when I started in film school, I was like, I'm gonna be, the film student who, who shoots a feature film and, you know, while in film school and takes it to Sundance. And, does, and I was not that student, you know? Uh, that's incredibly hard to do. And also, um, it would have been a terrible feature film because I had so much to learn, you know? Like, I went into film, I thought I was a genius. I thought I was a genius. I thought I was a genius. And then really when he realized he wasn't a genius, he stopped believing in geniuses exactly. all the time. Exactly. He's like, oh, no, <laughs> nobody's a genius. If I'm not a genius, no come on. Geniuses anyway. Obviously, no one is. <laughs> But, um, but no, I, I mean, I had so much to learn. It was kind of amazing. Um, but it also required, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's the ability to not take it personally, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to seek out criticism and, and um, learn from it uh, that will let you elevate your craft. Um, I mean, and one little addendum to that is, uh, is yes, 
particularly when you're starting out, seek out, you know, get, get feedback and, and take it seriously. Um, and if you hear something and you feel that little voice inside say, oh yeah, then really pay attention to it, you know, and, and, and yeah. try, try fixing it. At the same time, never ignore that voice in the back of your head. Yeah. I've got some stories about ignoring that voice that yeah. don't have voice. Yeah, because we all know, we know where our stuff is a little weak. Right, you know, and we, we lots of times we get away with it because we show it to our friends. We're like, "This is great," um, and and then we never, you know, and, and then we kind of ignore that voice. But we know, you know. Um, but at the same time, not everybody is going to be the right uh, person to show your stuff to, you know. And I, I think it's also important not to show your stuff, and, and it's totally fine. That you know, sometimes people that you really care about, sometimes people you know, maybe you're maybe the most important people in your life are not the people you want to share your work with. You know what I mean? Because they're not the audience. You know, and they don't get it. You know, and um, and uh, and maybe you know, like like if somebody fundamentally doesn't get the the the, the kind of story you want to tell, um, you know, if somebody just hates 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 horror movies, and you're trying to write a horror movie. Um, that person probably is not the best person to show it to. I mean, you're going to learn something from whoever you show it to, but but you, you know, it, it, it's worth thinking about. Um, sometimes, sometimes it isn't you, you know. Yeah. Sometimes it is them, you know. Uh, and uh, I tell that to a lot of people. It's but, definitely you. Yes, <laughs> but but you know, but but then you sometimes know, it is you. Again, that's that is the tricky thing, though. Yeah. To like. Listen to the listen to the voice that's telling inside that's telling you the truth, not the voice inside that's just telling you to ignore everybody because you were a genius. Right, and, and taking criticism, taking criticism is one thing. Analyzing the criticism is another thing. I think that's part of what you're getting at. Because um, sometimes you can get criticism, and, and somebody will say, "Well, yeah, I mean, I think it, it would work better if you did this, this, and this." And your response is, "But that's not the story I'm trying. Like that might not even be the genre I'm trying to tell a story in." Um, and so, and that's yeah, that's kind of your point, you know. And sometimes when I give stuff to folks that don't, sometimes I give I give stuff to read to people that don't know story real well or don't know, you know, whatever genre I might, you know, be working in real well. Because I want to see if I can break Crack through, that, break through yeah. that barrier a little bit, right? Okay. Um, and that's that is very valid. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, and then other times, like I, I want to give to somebody where I know they really know story really well in and out, and I'm, I'm going to get different kinds of criticism. And you've got to have some system, mm -hmm. right? And I have mine. I don't mind talking about it, but about how to evaluate that criticism and what that criticism should do. And one of the big things about criticism is even when you get that note from somebody that's like, I think you want to do this, this, and this, first of all, you're probably not going to react very well to that because you're like, don't rewrite my story. Um, but secondly, that's never, you're never going to do that thing they suggest, not because it's necessarily bad or wrong, but because it's your, it's your story. And what you look at with criticism is what's the underlying point behind that criticism. Yeah. What's working, what's not. Right. And so they, I, I mean, people talk about this all the time, like working with editors, that like, you know, an editor will sort of point to, a good editor will point to a place that's not quite working. And they, they may give you some, you know, suggestion, but the best editors that I've worked with are just like, you know, this, you know, they're, We'll, we'll talk about like what what might be missing, but then leave me to come up with the this, this solution. You know, right. um, and sometimes people will give you a solution, like Andy says. You know, don't you know? Like the solution may be really stupid, but the impulse behind it might be useful. I, or the solution they give you. Sorry. Or the solution they give you will tell you what they thought that scene was about. Yeah, and it may not be about that right. in your mind, but that still tells you something. Yeah, yeah. That what I thought that I thought I communicated with the scene was about. Apparently, I did not. Apparently, I did not. And that that yeah, finding Sorry, finding people who are going to help you do what you wanted to do is really I yeah. Think, what I was going to say is I really wish I could work with editors more. Um, I had an editor on my Scooby Doo. Uh, I did a couple of Scooby Doo's, and um, funny enough, I signed one this morning, the, single, the first one I did, and uh, the editor's note. On first draft was there's not enough monster in this script and it's a short story it's only about eight pages so it was for Mike Zaglain yeah 
And he goes, there's not enough monster in the script. And that's funny to say that. And uh, it makes sense when you think about it. Scooby-Doo is all about the monster. You know, so how are you going to you know, get the monster in there? And, and you know, in your head, you're like, I dialogued it, and I did this and everything. And then like, you just you, you think about it, and it's like the simplest suggestion that could have ever been given. And then you just find a way to make it work. And that's what a good editor does, I think. You know, like it just guides you, but not directs you. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, sometimes the best editing I've done has been when I was confused. Like, because sometimes you can read a scene or, or, or a comic and you're like, this doesn't, like, it's not clicking with me. But I might not be able to pinpoint it. You, I've gotten pretty good at it, uh, at pinpointing. But sometimes, you know, I used to do this with um, Peter David a lot. Like, I just call him up and be like, all right, let's just talk about this. And we would just talk. And we would not necessarily even talk specifically about that script, but we'd just talk about the characters, we'd talk about where they're going. And I wouldn't have to come up with anything. By the end of the conversation, he'd be like, hey, I'm going to do a rewrite on that. Yeah. And I didn't even mention that I thought it needed a rewrite. And he'd just be like, hey, I'm going to do a rewrite. I think I've got some insights here. And, so he, and, and he, Peter, was, he like, would go into those scripts like, with a scalpel. Like, you could barely tell that he touched it. But he would tweak sometimes just one line of dialogue here, and one line over here, um, and maybe one panel description or something, and it would just, it would just turn, and it, everything would just click into place. I mean, he was amazing at that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let's let's. Uh, I mean, I have more slides, but forget those. Let's get to your questions. What uh, what questions do you guys have? Like, where are you in your in your comics journey? Anybody? Yes. I am attending this panel. <laughs> okay. so, so this is it. This is the first step. Ray Bradbury would be proud. Yeah, that was that was actually fun hearing you talk about Ray. I was an Asimov. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. And and Asimov has a, has a, an essay that like blew my mind. Um, it was about adaptation, but it was really interesting. Changed the way I look at adaptation ever since then. So this is your first panel. So so you've got the rest of this show. So let's talk about what you can do at a Baltimore Comic Con. Given that this is my first Baltimore Comic Con, I don't know what can you do. Question. Uh, yeah. Um, how do like how people react to like different styles? Because I've seen like a handful of comics and stuff, and it seems like they're very like there's a very comic book style. Um, Are you so talking about art? Or yeah, right? art, okay. art wise. Um, like. How lenient are people on that? You know, do they like? Because I know Disney has this thing where they want you to draw every character like exactly according to like this. On model. Oh, they're, on they're model. Models yeah. And stuff. yeah. Sure. I know Disney does that, but like from your experiences, like, what's the range? I guess. It's it's wider and wider every year. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Um, it is. I, you know, I think for a long time there was, particularly with DC, there was a notion that there was sort of a house style. You know, like, and, you know, which is kind of a classic sort of coming from like Jim Apparel, uh, yep. you know, and, and through Jim Lee, you know what I mean? This sort of like, you know, standard, you know, gorgeous superhero style of, of art that, um, that was associated with those books. Um, but, uh, and, and that style still exists, and that, that style is still very popular and, and sells a lot of books, but there are tons of books on the shelves that vary from that style radically now. You know, like indie comics are huge, and manga is huge, and influences from both indie comics and manga have um, have have permeated mainstream, like the big two comics. Um, and you know, you look at Boom, you look at you look at Dark Horse, you look at all the other publishers, and there's an incredible range of art styles. You know, now if you want to draw a specific and like if you're looking at a specific problem, like Star Wars, like Star Wars comics at Marvel, um, are that is there's a slightly more limited range there. I mean, just slightly, right? but there's some, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's certain books that you know, like I mean, you know, like, I've, I've worked on a lot of licensed books and a lot of books that deal with likenesses. You know, I did the John Wick book, and for some of those, for some of those books, you know, like uh, having. Uh, like those licensors really want that kind of borderline photorealistic art, or more realistic art, and they want those likenesses to be on point. Your style to the type of story you're telling. So, like even when I was at Marvel, every Marvel book I ever worked on, because this is what Marvel does, is they make superhero stories. So, 
I got bored putting out 20 superhero comics a month. So the stuff that I got best known for was when I would mash that up with something else. So like, I did a, a mini series called Madrox and then it turned into X-Factor and that was, hey, it's superheroes, that way I can sell it at Marvel, but it's mashed up with film noir, so I'm interested in it. And so a different kind of, uh, different kind of art style was appropriate, a lot of heavy blacks, a lot of you know, stuff like that. Or with Annihilation, it was much more, I want to do science fiction, and it was a war story, so I was looking for people that could do more kind of war-looking comics. And so even within the range of just doing superheroes, I was yeah. still able to, to push out. Charlie Adler has a, has a different style that's not sort of like a house superhero style. Um, and the fact that somebody like uh, James Kachalka can have like a, a decades long career now in the same space as, as all of the people we think of on superhero comics. But you find the right story with your art. When it works, it works. Yeah. And it will connect with people. I mean, Raina Telgemeier is, as of two weeks ago, the number one selling author, period. Like, yeah, she's the, right. the biggest comics individual. And I don't see her in, drawing in a Marvel book. Yeah. Yeah. She doesn't need to, but why would she? She's the biggest right. comics person, not a comic. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but just to go back to your question for a second. Um, if this is your first show and you're interested in, in making your own comics, that show floor down there, that is a gold mine for you. Like go down and introduce your, yourself to folks, you know, whether you know their work or not. If you see work that you're, you're interested, ask questions. Just ask questions about their process, about how comics work, maybe how they broke in. Um, remember, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. You know, if you're at somebody's table, remember they are here to make money at the show. So, you know, if they're super busy, try not to like butt in or whatever. But um, if you're gonna talk with somebody, maybe stand a little bit to the side so you're not interrupting, you know, cutting them off from people seeing art and things that they're selling. Like try, try to be very mindful of not interrupting commerce, as that is largely what we're here for. But we're here to, to talk to people that are interested in our work and, and that would be, you know, I'll be down for most of the rest of the day, I'll be down at the Source Point Press booth, I've got my comic, I'll be selling and signing, but I'm happy to, to chat with folks. I'm happy to look at portfolios or, or whatever, because because I like comics. I want comics to be good. And in order for comics to be good and continue to grow and all that stuff, we need more comics creators. And we need more comics creators with voices that aren't the same as the people that are already doing it. Um, so this is a wonderful, wonderful resource for you at this show, just to, to talk to folks. And don't just talk to the sort of bigger name creators. Talk to folks that maybe are just to have a couple things out because their experiences are going to be really relevant because they're dealing with the industry as it is. Whereas, as fun as it may be to talk to, to Chris Claremont or Kevin McGuire or other people that I don't know if they're here or not, um, they broke in 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. That's probably not going to be super relevant um, in terms of what your experience is likely to be like. Now, does that mean you can't get relevant, cool tips from those guys? Absolutely not. They're, they're, they're really fonts of, of information, obviously. But I just wanted to kind of circle back on that and sort of talk about what you can do at the show. I think you had a question. If, you, if you're a creator and you, you sign on with uh, DC, Marvel, or anyone, and you bring in some, like a new storyline or some intellectual property, and it's used for other purposes like Hollywood or something to that, do you, is there a de facto contract that you sign that you're covered as someone new, or do you have to negotiate from the beginning? Um, there are stand I mean, when you sign, when you start to work with any company, you're going to sign a contract, or you'll you'll negotiate a contract. Um, and some of those are more negotiable than others. I mean, you should always negotiate. Um, but there are certain things that they are, you know, not gonna, they're not going to move on. Um, if you're doing licensed work, if you're working on characters that already exist in an existing universe for these companies, they're going to, generally speaking, they're going to own everything. You know what I mean? They're going to own that that uh, intellectual property. So you're, that's what you're signing on for. You're getting paid to contribute to that. Um, and you'll get a nice get, thank you in the credit. Yeah, yeah, and, and you can, I mean, and, and different, you know, different companies have different kinds of policies about like, you know, stuff gets used elsewhere, you know, there, there's often royalties, so there's some kind of payment. Um, but the, uh, the, the place, I mean, you know, on a business sense, the place where creators are cashing in is by doing creator-owned work. You know, when you're, when you're creating at home. When, yeah. You know, when you create your own work, you and your artist, you, I mean, in a lot of situations, the 
the writer and the artist, the creative team, they share copyright, and then if that gets sold, you know, if you, you make a movie or whatever spin-off out of that, then those, then you're the creators who are gonna, you know, reap that benefit, whatever benefit that may be. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you, there's, um, I mean, that's, that's stuff that you're looking at. You, you want to make sure those are, you know, make sure you understand your contracts before you sign and, uh, you know, and that you're, you're willing to do it. I mean, the trade-off, I mean, obviously I work, I, I, I work for tons, I do tons of work for hire, so the trade-off is definitely worth it, you know, for me. Um, and I, but I, at the same time, I'm also doing tons of, or I'm trying to do, I've, I've done a lot of creator-owned stuff because that's incredibly important as well, you know, for, yeah, yeah and, I, and I've shifted the bulk of my kind of work for hire work has shifted out to LA because I can usually get paid more for the amount of time I spend, which means I have more money to spend on my creator own comics mm -hmm. and more time. When you say to LA, you mean like film and TV? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah like I, I, I do a fair amount of consulting work in LA. I'm not, I'm not writing big budget movies or anything, but, um, but you know, I have found that that works. You know, as I, you know, I think you were the one that said that I took the. Like, what did you say it was? I have the reverse career trajectory. Oh, yeah, you are reverse career trajectory. It, so, like, I started at Marvel, like, when they were hitting, like, a heyday. And that's where I started in comics. And then I, then I keep sort of going smaller and smaller. And, and the, what I realized is that's just where my interests are. I'm, I'm less interested. I don't read many superhero comics anymore. I don't dislike superheroes. I just don't read that many superhero comics because I've, I've been reading them for so long. And I'm much more interested in creator own work. And my, my own work is more Great. interested in right next to you. I just read jump. Greg's superhero okay, comics. Just jump. <laughs> uh, well, everybody does. So Greg. So you're, because I only read work by geniuses. So there you go. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, yeah. I feel like I have to be the wet blanket, though, and discourage that type of thinking. Because, again, this is a breaking into comics panel. So, we're assuming no one has broken in. Um, I wouldn't get into comics to try to get a Netflix deal. Like, at all. Like, it might happen. I mean, it might happen for at least one of you. Um, but it might not happen for 99% of you. I would not encourage thinking that way, at least not yet. Um, right. yeah. Put out your book. You know, um, get work from Marvel, DC, great. But do the work first. Also, then let that come to the yeah. you know, so. I, I mean, yeah. it's, do this because you love it. Yeah. yeah. Right. But but if you're going to do creator own work, talk talk to a lawyer right. and make sure you have your contract set up so that you. I mean, no matter what work you do, make sure you talk to a lawyer because yeah. I, I totally agree with Vito that um, first and foremost you're trying to do good work. Right. You know, and and because there's no there's no get rich quick scheme in comics. There's no get rich quick scheme anywhere unless you're a criminal. In which case we could have another discussion. There's lots of ways to make money, but uh, but no, but uh, you know, but but it's it the the things that break through are the things that people have slid, you know have, have just bled and cried into for years that are that are that are that that are really work. You know what I mean? And and also that 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 are lucky that hit at the right time. Passion rarely leads to winning a lot. Yeah. So, but 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 that. You know, you, so you have to love it. You have to be doing it because you love it. But at the same time, get your business in order right. so that if it, if those opportunities do come, that you're you're protected and you're covered. And also so that you don't get into a weird situation where you've kind of been doing this by the seat of your pants and there's no contracts and 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 um, and then suddenly the whole thing is is uh, you can't proceed for legal reasons. You know we, what I mean? We have mostly writers here, right? From the show of hands earlier. So most of you are going to have to, unless you also draw, um, you're going to have to work with an artist. The thing that I did um, I, I, with Stray, somebody said, seemed to recognize it straight, what Stray was, but uh, with Sean, um, we both recognized that the art is possibly the most important thing. Uh, yeah, it was an idea that I came to him with, and he agreed to do it with me, but we co-own it 50-50, we both agreed uh, that our colorist was going to get uh, part of the royalty, so it's 45, 45, 10. Uh, I letter the book thanks to Andy's uh, comics experience, so I've saved money from uh, hiring a letterer. But these things were all things that we discussed ahead of time. You know, 
so that we were uh, uh, not financially, but you know, like contractually obligated to each other, but yeah. also like cover. Yeah. So that, that I don't, I, I never want to be the one. Like, and unfortunately, I, I'm always the one that gets the contracts, but I'm not the <coughs> guy who created Stray. It was John and I, you know, and I'll be the first and last person to say that. So. Yeah, and, Joe, and let me now watch, watch value added. You're going to get a million dollars in legal advice right now. <laughs> There's a rule, most of you people, I'm a writer as well. I don't draw uh, stick figures. I don't think they count. Um, a lot of times you want to own your, you have to decide, do I want to share this? Do I want to own it? Do I want to? And what you have is, if you want to own it, I cannot tell you how many people come to me and they're like, oh, we did this handshake deal and I paid them $100 a page or $75 a page. And then at the end, they're like, they're like so we own it equally. And I'm like, no, you, like, it's not yours. You didn't, because the only way to transfer intellectual property is in writing. And in most states, the only way to transfer intellectual property is in writing where it says it's work for hire and it's before the work is done. So you can't do, um, there's a, there was a big lawsuit about Walking Dead because, and that was over clearances because they had a contract but they weren't good enough. So they had to go back and then it ended up in lawsuits. And you never want to end up in a lawsuit because the best time to do your contract is when you guys actually like each other in the beginning and not when, you know, because there's no, I say this in my book, there is no bad guys in litigations. There's just two guys, two people who, through the lens of history, think they were wrong. And so, you know, there really is, you know, there's, nobody is wrong in those. They just think, well, this is my case and this is my, you know, this is my view. So what you want to do is definitely you want to have, um, I think I did some posts on our, our, our webpage, on like you want to have offer and acceptance and you want to have all yeah. of those things that make a contract. You don't necessarily need, if it's your first comic, to have like a high price lawyer to negotiate the pinball machine rights. But you want to at least have something in writing that both of you sign that say, this is what we, I'm paying you for, this is what you're doing, this is when you get it to me, and I own it if that's the arrangement that you work. Or I own 51% of it so that when later on you want to decide and somebody, you have a My Little Pony book and Penthouse wants it for equestrian sex and Hasbro wants it to make toys and you can't agree because they're each more lucrative. So, look at that face. That was an awesome face. That's very specific. It was very specific. <laughs> All right, we'll go you and then you. Yeah. Um, so the luck and the persistence part, um, would it be a good policy or philosophy to be um, Kickstarters, anthologies, and developing niches, or a, a combination of three? All three? Yeah. A I, yeah, a combination. And I'm a huge proponent of short stories because, especially for writers, because if you can, A, you can write a short story that's good, that's usually more difficult than writing something longer, but it's also a lot easier to get that produced and published and printed and in somebody's hands. One of the reasons it's easier is because asking somebody to draw a five page, eight page, 10 page story and, and them accomplishing that is a lot easier than going, hey, we got this 58 issue magnum opus that I want you to do. Like, it's just never gonna happen. Um, and once you have a couple of short stories out there, then you're like, see, I've done these short stories. I'm a real person, right? And I can do things. And then you can maybe maybe do a one-shot, maybe do another one-shot, you know, and still do short stories. And, and it also allows you, you know, on your social media or if you're going to multiple shows to go, I've got this new thing. Right. And then the next time you simply, I've got this new story. I've got this new thing. Like, you, the, you know, the perception of producing stuff is, is very important. And I'll just create help, help. Creatively, when you do a bunch of those little short things, I mean, I, I came up through film and I made a million short films, you know, like little, I, I was lucky, I'm, I'm old enough that when I first started in film school, we were editing on 16 millimeter film and shooting on 16 millimeter film, which is really expensive, you know, that was like a thousand dollars a minute, right? You know, uh, you know, when you tally all the costs to, to finish a film. Um, but, um, but, but I was lucky because digital video became available and digital editing and, and now everybody's got a moving machine in their pocket, you know what I mean? So, um, but it, actually making a bunch of little short films and, and finishing them, you know, like making them and finishing yeah. them and then doing another one and, you know, and, and not being, I mean, making each one as good as I could make them, but not being too precious. Like, no one of those was my only project that I was ever going to do. I had a professor at film school who was amazing. He used to always say, this is not your epic, you know, when we were working on these short films, you know, he would, because 
like you gotta you gotta be able to you know it's like it's like Ray Bradbury. You're writing that short story. You're moving on to the next one. You know what I mean? You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get better with each one. Um, but so doing a bunch of short things, I think, is huge. And and I thought you you were mentioning anthology projects. Right now, anthology comics projects. That's that's one of the best ways to get experience and, and to get something done and get stuff out in the world. There's just tons of them going on and new creators are, are working on those all the time and it's a way to do like a four page story, a six page story um, and, uh, and learn from it, you know. I, in a funny way I'm realizing, I, you know, so I, I broke into comics coming in from film and, and broke into Marvel. Like Marvel, the editors of Marvel saw my movie Robot Stories. They liked it, they brought me in, they read the screenplay, and then they were like, okay, let's, let's develop some stuff. And so it was like, I, I mean, I, I, I was incredibly lucky. I, I, I sort of moved into the sort of the, the top flight of work for higher comics, right? But then I kind of had to break into creator own comics in a funny way. And one of the, and because I, you know, I had all these creator own projects that I wanted to do, and, um, uh, and I, I did a lot of, I, I did a number of these uh, short, you know, I wrote these short stories uh, uh, and got various artists to draw them and, they, and uh, a couple of them were in these uh, anthologies that Mike Woods put together, these western anthologies. And that eventually, and, and so I did these little short stories with a Chinese gunslinger and then eventually did Kingsway West, which was my first uh, creator-owned, uh, uh, you know, comic book series. Um, in a similar way, uh, I did, uh, I contributed to this Asian, Tak Miyazawa and I collaborated on this story about a kid and a giant robot, um, and then for an anthology, an Asian American comics anthology, and then, uh, and then later that became Mecca Den Yu, uh, which was uh, one of the creator-owned series that I'm now best known for, uh, mm -hmm. which went, which was a great run and boom. Um, and, um, so, but, but doing those, uh, the other bonus of doing those anthologies is that if you if you if you do them strategically, sometimes those can be little pilots that are proof of concept for a, for a series. Um, the person you're talking about, the guy that does all the short stories and then notes up, is actually me. You know, like, like I told you guys before, I did a Batman Adventures that was five pages. Then I did a, a year later, I did uh, an anthology with a bunch of my friends. That was with uh, Michel Fife, that's Cobra, uh, his first story. Uh, a year later, I did uh, X Men Unlimited for 11 pages. And like every year, the page count started getting a little bit more. I had to do three pages for a Scooby Doo story. Three pages to do a three act story is not easy, but I did it. And it was well received, you know. So, and that's a huge learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's the one reason, like, it was funny because uh, the one thing that I want to say, um, in terms of breaking into comics, uh, especially this early stage, is say yes to everything. Um, because I never wanted to write Scooby Doo, but thank God I did. Because it did teach me, and it did get me uh, kind of in with Mike Sibley, who eventually uh, was working on Superman Confidential. That got canceled, and then Matt Idelson, the, uh, the editor of Superman, needed an issue. And my issue of Superman Confidential became Superman 676. So I got really lucky. And the thing is, I said yes to an opportunity I didn't want, and it worked out for me. So I just say yes until the day you can say no. Hey, Bill, let me interrupt for a second. Yeah. Adam, are you on the next panel? Yeah. Hey, we're going to get off the stage. Oh. Because I think it's time for your panel, right? Uh, you know, honestly, ours was on again and off again and off again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you guys want to stick around and learn about Comic Club, uh, honestly, from, especially for uh, uh, TV publishers, uh, there's a huge opportunity for you to start uh, accessing comics retailers. But uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. But yeah, I mean, you can, you know, whatever. Really. Comic Club is, is, a really, is a really cool thing. Yes. Uh, so, it, and, it, and it is going to be, if not already, I mean, it already is a useful tool for a lot of folks. Um, <coughs> But I don't want to eat any of your time. There was a sign on the door that was like, hey, that, that panel after you canceled so you Okay, we, we'll take the, the one last question I said we take, and then we'll, we'll let you guys go. Yes. So, uh, Rick, how did you decide to work with Jonathan Colton? Oh, I went to college with Jonathan. So uh, my advice to you is also to go to college with somebody who becomes an internet superstar musician. <laughs> um, because, uh, so I went, to, I went to college with Jonathan Colton, and years later, uh, he became Jonathan Colton. 
um, who is, uh, I think he's known, like he did the theme song for Portal, he did a soft rock version of Baby Got Back. He, he, he's one of the first musicians who um, sort of became famous by putting songs on the internet, you know, like he, he and, and now he's, he's all over the place. He, he, did, he like contributed songs to the SpongeBob musical and he's got a cruise. And we did these uh, kicks, we did, we've done a series of Kickstarter books together. Um, we did one called Code Monkey Save World, based on uh, a bunch of characters from his, uh, from his, uh, from his songs. And then we did, uh, we've done two children's books, The Princess Who Saved Herself and The Princess Who Saved Her Friends, also based on one of his songs. I've got The Princess Who Saved Her Friends downstairs at table 212, by the way. Um, but that's, but th this is also an example of um, jump on those opportunities, you know what I mean? Because this was, uh, you know, there's a certain point when I was listening to Jonathan's songs, and I was like, dang, these would really, there's characters, there's story here, and this could be something. And, um, and so we ended up doing these Kickstarters, uh, and, uh, and, and it was a whole new audience for both of us. It was tremendous. So, um, but, but yeah, look, you know, finding those weird connections that end up turning into cool projects. I mean, run down those little Warren holes, or I, I don't know where that came from. That's kind of a cool thing. <laughs> That's kind of the cool thing about doing the anthologies is usually you end up um, teaming up with somebody who's also trying to break in, and you end up being lifelong friends, you know, or, or you know, at the worst, you end up being lifelong collaborators, you know. So it's it, there, are, like we were saying, there's opportunities everywhere. So um, internet makes everybody. Equal. Like Greg said, this is a movie maker. Uh, you know, laptops mean you can go anywhere and write. You know, Google, like Google Chrome, like Chromebooks, you can write literally everywhere. You know, so it's. And I, I'm, you know, I don't want Google looking at my stuff, but you know, <laughs> the, the thing is, like, there the when I'm sure when Greg was uh, in film school, and you know when I was in college, uh, drinking too much probably. Um, the opportunities weren't there because you had to be special. And, and I'm not saying none of us are special, I'm just saying that the thinking was that you had to be at the right place at the right time, you had to be uh, kind of extraordinary uh, or more extraordinary and, than somebody else. Well, and you, well, you had to have thousands of dollars if, yes. you, make, if you were going to make a short film. Yeah. You know, even if you were going to make a short film, you had to have literally thousands of dollars. Um, but yeah, so you know, so there's yeah, yeah and like I was like I told you guys earlier, I was trying to break into acting, and you know they tell you that um, the one guy from you know one guy from uh, 700 schools is going to be the guy that makes the NFL, or the one you know the one person that went to Case Western is going to be the next you know opera singer or whatever you know. So the opportunities in those entertainment realms are, are much much rarer, uh, but. YouTube has made the ability to make movies, uh, to become internet sensation. Uh, like that's how I knew Jonathan was from YouTube. Um, the Megan Trainer, I think, was started on YouTube as well. You know, now she's a judge on one of those talent shows. Which uh, you know, let that be what it is. Um, but you know what I mean. Like the people that you are now looking at as you know celebrities all now have the. Uh, Ability to do things online. Well, in, and in the web comics world, there are web comics creators who are who are reaching, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands more people than yeah. mainstream comics. So there are, you know, there's a lot of different ways to break. I mean, breaking into comics, we tend to think of like, oh, I'm working for Marvel or DC, that's a fantastic thing, and 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 I highly recommend it. You know what I mean? Um, but that it's it's by it's no so means the only way to. To one, make comics, it's and the two, exception to not make money. money. You know, there's a million every day. There's a new way to, to do it. You know, so keeping apprised of all of those trends, you know, is is smart. All right, we're gonna wrap up. Vito, where are you? Uh, I'm at the end of the table. No, I'm at uh, uh, 921. Is my. Uh